who hatched the plan? <laughs> we didn't have a plan. <laughs> you, when you're desperate and you need help, you, you, don't, you don't think about busting through some guy's ceiling and, and being lowered on a mat and ruining his house as a bad idea. How we pulled that operation off. <laughs> That's a story for another day. <laughs> but it's a good one. Anyway, you should have seen the look on everybody's face as, as I was coming through the roof. They're all looking up at me, and I'm all sprawled out on that mat going, Hello? <laughs> and they are all shocked, but Jesus. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at every face. They're stunned, but Jesus is just looking at me with this great big smile on his face like he was expecting me. He looked up at my buddies. He looked at me. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now listen, I, I wasn't lying on a mat because I was exhausted from running a marathon. I was lying on a mat because my legs didn't work. And he says to me, your sins are forgiven? I'm thinking, sins? What about my legs? You see, I, I didn't get it at that time. When Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, He's kind of... No, He's not kind of saying it. He's, he's claiming to be God. I don't have the time to tell you all the things the religious leaders told us we had to do in order to earn forgiveness of sins. Let me just say, it would be easier to move a mountain. And here Jesus is just giving it away? <laughs> Everybody in that room must have been thinking the same thing I was thinking. Who does this guy think he is? Well, You don't forgive sins if you're not God. And you don't do this if you're not God either. Listen, I came into that place desperate to stand on my own two feet. And I walked out of there freed from sin. That's the kind of miracle that doesn't just change me. That changes everything. Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You please. My cause, you right my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you give your life to give me mine. You say that I.
you were alive back in Jesus's day and you heard that there was this guy that was saving people your thought of salvation would not have been oh he's gonna save me from my sins that was something that was just you know too difficult too much involved that just cannot be actually they would have thought of it more like saving like the guy did from physical ailments of some kind limitations of some kind or maybe maybe saving from you know a health issue, a financial issue, saving from the Roman government. I mean, there are a lot of things. Now, if you actually lived in Indiana at that time, you'd probably be like, save me from this pothole or something like that, you know. It, or probably better, save me from this weather. Hasn't this been crazy? So uh, I was thinking the other day that maybe we ought to change the four official seasons. What, what are they? Uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter? I think I got those right. I, I think we should change them, though. I think in Indiana, they should have their own seasons. See if you agree with me. I think we need to have a season called almost winter. Winter. Still winter. And construction. <laughs> this is why when we get a day like this, a spring day, we get so excited, we almost wet our plants. Boy, so this, this guy back in Jesus' day would have been completely shocked when Jesus said your sins are forgiven because he's like, well, it doesn't really work that way because when, when you mess up, and, and you know what messing up with God is, right? It's called a sin. When you, when you say something that is inappropriate, when you are, are thinking something that you really ought not be thinking, and when you when you do what you're not supposed to do, even when you celebrate the wrong of somebody you don't like. Come on, some of you have done that, right? That's a sin, and that has to be paid for. That, that has to be, that has to be uh, atoned for. That has to be, there needs to be some kind of transaction. It's not a gift to be let off the hook, to be saved, to be freed. There's nothing like that in this mindset. It is a transactional I need to bring a sacrifice that costs me something, and I need to bring it to a priest and go through the ritual transaction. We do these all the time. If you shop at Aldi, you, you make a transaction. You go through the store, you load up your cart with food, you push that. You don't just walk out the door with a cart. You have to go stand in an enormous line. That's what you have to do. 
And then you have to, and even if they open up a new line, you still have to wait for the person to get there. Isn't that crazy? And then you load it onto the conveyor belt, they check it out, and then you exchange money. There's a transaction involved because you have rung up a debt. You need to owe that debt in order to take these products with you. And so if you, you know, cheated on your taxes, if you uh, broke confidence with somebody, if you did something that is wrong, if words came out of your mouth that shouldn't have, even if it's because of the weather, it's a sin, and it must be paid for, and there's a price. And so when Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven, it didn't really make sense. There's no transaction occurring there between this man and God. And yet what Jesus is actually saying is, I've got this. I'll take care of this. And he did. He went to the cross and he took care of it for that man. He went to the cross. He took care of it for all of us. He pushed shopping cart after shopping cart after shopping cart to the top of Mount Calvary. And in his blood paid for every single sin we had racked up. That's what he did. And he says, you're, you owe nothing. You're off the hook. And I love the fact that the man also gets what he wanted when he came down through the roof. He got his legs healed, which I think is tremendous. It's great because it's proof, you know, if he can heal legs, he can forgive sins. But I think it's also a gift in the sense that I don't, I'm not sure all of us really appreciate what it is like to have our sins forgiven. It, it's a hard concept to get our heads around. And Jesus gives this man something tangible that he can hold on to. He's freed from the limitation of not being able to walk, and now he can. God has gifted him. Jesus has gifted him with an experience. And I think we all need that experience. And if you've ever had one, you, you know how wonderful it is to have an experience of being let off the hook. If you've ever had this great debt and the bills come in, you don't know how you're going to pay it, and all of a sudden somebody steps in, somehow it happens, and you've got that debt paid off, you've experienced being saved from a huge financial burden. Maybe it's the doctor coming in and saying, look, it was there, I don't know where it's at now, I can't see it on the x-rays, and you're like, I know where that came from, praise God, I've been saved from that. If you've ever experienced those things, a relationship you thought was over, was you've lost it because of what you've done, and yet it gets restored. You've experienced... What Jesus, I think, wants us each to experience in life so that we can grasp a hold of something that is much deeper, much greater, the actual forgiveness of sin. I want to ask you a question. Do you remember the first time you were saved? Now, I don't mean, you know, in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope that's true for you. That, more than anything, is what I want for you. And if it's not there for you, I pray by the end of today, that happens for you. What I'm asking, though, is... When was the first time you were, you know, let off the hook or you uh, didn't get what you deserved? Maybe you're a little guy and you got in trouble and you took the cookie from the cookie jar and mama found out and you got crumbs all over you. And yet, and yet you said, I didn't do it. And she said, I know you did. And, but she forgave you anyway. When was the first time that happened for you? I want to share one that happened to me and... It, I, honestly, this, is, this can't be the first time it has ever happened to me, but it was pretty cool. It was a great experience. I was 10 years old. I was 10 years old. I'm visiting with my family, the Richies, which are our best friends. We used to live next door. We did everything together, went on vacations together. Now we live like 25 minutes away, and we're going back over to their house, and it's always exciting. We love them. Bruce, big guy, dad, and intimidating guy and yet he's funny and mom uh, Maria is from Costa Rica and has oh, just the neatest accent love to hear her talk and and then there was there was the oldest John and I always thought John was the coolest kid ever I told my parents over and over again why'd you name me Jeff I wanted to be named John I really wanted to be John then the youngest, Ryan, he was a little younger than me, but we hung out together. And then the middle child was Tammy Ritchie. Ah, oh, Tammy Ritchie. Ah, oh, she was beautiful. She was the prettiest girl I ever knew back then. And 
I just, we just love being over at their house. So this one time we're back visiting the Richies and we're having a good time and I'm with Ryan in their spare bedroom and they've got a video game hooked up and this is a long time ago. So this is, this is like archaic video games. It's right, it, it's a video game that came out right after Pong. So it's not in black and white, it's in color, but it's right before Atari. So it's not, and Atari was poor graphics too, it's even worse, but for us that was all we had and I just thought this was the greatest thing because all I had back at home was Pong. He had, he had color video and I'm just playing that and I'm enjoying that and it's so cool and, and I'm not even paying attention to the fact that I got to pee. <laughs> and the longer I play, the more I got to and the more I play the more I got it and it's getting to the point where it's starting to interrupt from my fun but I don't want to stop but I have to so I stop sitting in that position and I cross my legs so that I'm you know in a better tighter position but the pain is getting really bad I'm up dancing at one point as I'm playing the thought of pausing never occurred to me and then it happened no 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 you're way ahead of me it was just a little something but it was enough to know I was in trouble. I dropped that remote and I scrambled out of that room and I ran to the bathroom and I tried to get the door closed and I tried to get my little jeans before I got them unsnapped, it happened. Oh, I know, oh. <laughs> there, was a, there was almost like this double feeling of complete relief. Once it started, I could not stop and I'm like, oh, I'm pain free. I'm also not dry. And now what do I do? And I look down at my, at my little, you remember the Sears tough skin jeans? Yeah. I look down at my little Sears tough skin jeans and they're supposed to be one shade of denim blue. <laughs> down below, they're the normal denim color. Right here, it's all midnight blue. <laughs> and my little shirt wasn't gonna, and I didn't know what to do and I'm panicking the thought also did not cross my mind to go tell my mama so I tried to solve this on my own I'm in the guest bathroom of the Ritchie home I wet my pants, not my plants, I wet my pants and I'm in trouble and I figure there's only one thing to do I gotta get my two-tone denim jeans back to one tone again so I turn on both spigots of the water and I start splashing water all over my jeans all the way down, all the way back. I mean, I spent some time on this. They are now soaked. I don't know what the floor looked like. I don't even remember cleaning it up. I just know that when I walked out of that bathroom, I was one tone of blue. <laughs> now I needed time for them to dry, and so I went and I hid in Ryan's bedroom under his blankets. I didn't say we were close friends. I just said we were friends. And Ryan comes looking for me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm playing hide and seek. So he crawls under the blankets with me. I'm like, uh-oh, confined space, jeans wet. He says, what's that smell? I said, what smell? I don't smell anything. For the rest of the night, I avoided, I avoided parents. I avoided my sisters. And I especially avoided Tammy Ritchie. <laughs> the night ended way too soon. My jeans were still wet. We had to go. No, I didn't have to go again. We had to go home. <laughs> and I dreaded that. I was like, oh, I'm going to sit in the back seat with my two sisters. And they're going to they're gonna touch my wet jeans. Or, or they're going to smell something. And I, I delayed as long as I possibly could. Everybody else was in the car. The car was already started. Dad's in the front. Mom's in the front. My two sisters in the back. But when I got to the car, horror of horrors, there was a third person in the back seat, sitting halfway on my seat and my sister Jennifer's seat next to her with her night bag. Tammy Ritchie was staying the night. <laughs> I climbed into that car, pressed up against the door the entire trip, like, don't touch my jeans. Oh, that was the longest car ride of my life. And you know what? Nobody said a word. I mean, literally, there was no word said the entire car trip home. 
And the reason for that, at the time, I thought, I'm getting away with it. I'm getting away with it. And it was awesome that I was getting away with it because I thought this was going to be the most humiliating. It's bad enough that my sisters find out, but Tammy, Richie, come on. What I found out later is the reason why no one was talking is because they all knew, and ahead of time they had agreed, they're not going to say anything, and they didn't. Actually, they said nothing the entire trip home. <laughs> you know what? That's grace. I'm so glad they didn't. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. They knew, but I didn't know they knew. That's fine with me. It's great to be saved from something, isn't it? It's a great feeling. There's nothing like it. Over the years, I've been saved from a lot of things. I was saved from a bad sickness. My appendix almost burst as a teenager. And, and I had gangrene, and the doctor said I almost died. In fact, every time I went back to Dr. Wood, he always said, Jeff, you remember when you almost died? Those were always great hospital trips or you know, doctor visits. I almost lost a job, I, uh, but I was saved from that too. I, I made this huge mistake when I managed a bookstore for college and the order didn't come in on time and the books were not on the shelf when the, when the first day of classes arrived. And as a college bookstore manager, you have one job, and I failed that one job. <laughs> but I was saved from losing that job. I also was one time lost, totally lost, for two hours in the back roads of Wisconsin. I was 16 years old with my grandma on a vacation trip. We were at this lake visiting her sister's family, and I was sent to get some ice or something from the store, I don't remember now. And I took off and went to the store. I found the store fine. On the way back, I made some wrong turns, several of them. I found the lake. It was the wrong lake. Uh, and I just, I was completely lost. I, I didn't know where I was, and, and the only reason why I wasn't lost more than two hours is because I finally asked someone for directions. <laughs> Who knew that would work? So being saved from something is an amazing feeling, and God gives this to the man who cannot walk so that he can understand an even greater truth that he has saved him and set him free from something so much bigger, a debt he could never repay on his own. And I think God does this for us, and we need this to happen because the reality is, the truth is, that Jesus hasn't come to help us out in every single problem of life. In fact, Jesus came to save our souls. That's the purpose for his coming. And that's awesome. He's not guaranteeing that every hospital trip is going to end with good news. He, he's not guaranteeing that every financial crisis will be turned around. Right? He's not guaranteeing that every 10-year-old boy is going to be saved from the embarrassment of wetting his pants. But he guarantees this. This is why he's come, that if we would trust in him, we have salvation for our souls. And that is so cool. And that is so good. The, the irony in all of this is, is, is the fact that in order for Jesus to provide this for us, this, this gift where there's no transaction between us and God because we are set free from that debt, there has to be a transaction between Jesus and his Father. He, of all people, could save himself, and he says, no, I can't because I must pay for you and your sins. So Jesus willingly went to give himself up. I think it is so cool when you think about Jesus riding on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem when Jesus knew there were religious leaders there wanting to kill him, and he went anyway. He wasn't trying to escape. Have you ever seen a donkey move? They're slow, and he's heading in the wrong direction. He's coming into town, and he's saying, here I am. I willingly give myself up. But that doesn't mean it wasn't filled with a lot of anguish. In fact, we can read about that anguish. In John 12, it says, Now my heart is troubled. He knew what was coming. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? He, he, he was born like us. He grew up like us. He experienced everything that we experienced in life. He had the, the, the feelings of dread from what was coming and he could see in his foreknowledge that he would be pinned to the cross and nailed to the cross and he'd be stripped and beaten and ridiculed and falsely accused. He knew what was coming and he cries out the same heart cry all of us have when we're in pain, when we're in trouble, when we're struggling, save me! But he says, I can't, I can't do that. He says, no, it's for this very reason I've come to this hour. The only thing he asks is, Father, glorify your name. This is for you, Dad. And then as the Roman soldiers are actually nailing him to the cross, he cries out, Father, forgive them, for 
for they know not what they're doing. As nails are going into his hands, he is asking for that blood that is being spilled to count for them as well. Let that be enough payment for even what they're doing to me in this moment, Father. The very one who could opt out of this chooses not to because he's the only one that can save us. He says, no, I won't save myself so I can save you. When Jesus said these words and then breathed his last, hung on that cross, lifeless, was taken down and buried, what he meant by this is, the transaction is done. I have paid for your debt. It's finished. This past week, I finished an audio book on Audible. Uh, it used to be called Books on Tape. If you've ever listened to one in the car, I listened to this on my phone. I finished an Audible book, 17 hours long, on this guy's life, Walt Disney. 17 hours. If you've been trying to get a hold of me lately and you haven't been successful, now you know why. Okay, I didn't listen to it in one sitting. I'm just kidding. Why would anybody spend 17 hours listening to somebody's life? Because I'm a fan. I'm, I love Disney, all things Disney. I can't help it. I get it completely honestly. I grew up as, as, as a child. Uh, when I lived next to the Richies, we were like, like 25 to 30 minutes away from Disney. When we moved to Villa Park, we were like 15 minutes away from Disneyland in Southern California, and it was, it was just always around. I mean, when we went to the park, it was as exciting for me as a child as, as Christmas morning. The same feelings you had on Christmas morning is what I had when we went to Disneyland. And, and every time it was special and every time it was neat. And what was really cool being so close to Disney is at 9 o'clock every night, we could actually hear the fireworks from the park. I mean, we could step outside if we wanted to, and sometimes we did, and you could see the tops of the fireworks just over the trees. This, the fireworks that happen over the castle after Tinkerbell flies across, the fireworks go. You could see the little tops of them, and it's just so cool. So I, I even worked there as, as a college student. I worked at Disneyland. I had, like, the dream job. I went there, like, because like, I, I like acting and stuff, and so I went there, like, hey, I want to be a performer, and, and, and uh, I, pff, no clue. Could I actually perform with, like, they had this Mickey Mouse Club thing going, and... And uh, the guy's like, yeah, you're at the wrong place for that because um, we hire for the attractions here. Um, you actually have to go through a talent agency. You have to have an agent in order to perform. And I'm like, oh, that's too bad. He says, you know what, though? There, is, uh, there, is a few, there are a few roles in the park that require some acting, and one of them is on the Jungle Cruise. I'm like, oh, I love the Jungle Cruise. I'll take it. So I became a Jungle Cruise skipper. I was. It was a blast. We got to take people on a boat ride through the rivers of the world, and, and, and all these animatronic animals were on this ride. They're like animals that look real and move, and, 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 and they make sounds, and you'd go through the elephant wading pool. And, of course, as the guide, you pretend to ride the boat, but it's on a track, so, you know, you're really just there to make jokes. And so, uh, you know, we're like, hey, we're going through the elephant wading pool, and it's okay, you don't have to cover your eyes. In fact, you can take pictures. All the elephants have their trunks on. <laughs> so, oh man, the jokes, the, the, the jokes, uh, I remember the spiel from the, the beginning to the very end, and if you want to buy me dinner, I will share that entire spiel for you. <laughs> so, uh, 17 hours you know, that was nothing to me. I loved it. I loved it. Oh, well, okay, honestly, except for the last hour. Because the last hour had to do with the last days of Disney's life, and it didn't end the way I thought it would. You know, here's a guy who, he, he creates this first fully immersive, family-friendly theme park. He, he created the very first sound cartoon. He created the very first full featured animated movie, Snow White. I mean, Walt Disney, he's, he's a rags to riches story. He, he's an uh, amazing storyteller. He created one of the most recognizable brands around the world and yet he never felt like he did enough. 
that he accomplished enough. He had so much more. He never let people write a biography on him until real late, late in life because he just, he didn't want it. He thought he had so much more to do and so much more to give and he never felt like it was worthy, it was good enough. He just felt like he somehow had to make that transaction with God. You've given me these gifts. I have to give the world this something. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Paul tells us, for it's by grace. You can't earn grace. You've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. You didn't do this. It is the gift of God not by works that, so that no one can boast. You, you're not going to get to heaven and say, look at the castle I built and the fireworks over it and look at the movies. And God's like, did you receive my gift, my son? Did you trust in him? Did you live for him? Did you make your life about him? Look, when Walt Disney eventually got lung cancer and then had this major operation and it really knocked him down, he convinced a close buddy of his to release him from the hospital and he didn't go home though he went to both his studios he went to his Imagineering studio he, he went to his film production studio and he's telling everybody at these massive corporations he's telling everybody I'm back and it's all good and I'm getting better I think he was trying to convince himself when he was driven home that night he never came back and he spent the last of his days in the hospital still believing he would get better because he had more to do my hero, my childhood hero, wasn't ready to stand face to face with the very creator God who gave him all these gifts. For somebody who gave us so many happily ever after as his wasn't. And I don't mean that he died. We all have to face our own death. We do. At one point or another, we all have to face that. But he died without hope. Nobody should die without hope. Nobody. The promise of Easter is this. No one has to die without hope. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wandering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Jesus has risen tells us that there was a bigger transaction that occurred when he hung upon the cross. Not only was he setting us free from our eternal debt of sin, but he was setting us free from death itself. He's the firstborn among the dead. He said he's the resurrection and the life. He, those who believe in him, though they die, because we all have to face that, shall live. What we fear and what we dread is that it's all over and that there's nothing more and yet what we have to understand is that this is just the beginning and what God is promising is not only eternal but better. And everything that we taste in this life that includes the pain and the sorrow will be freed of that pain and sorrow but even more than that will be better. The images we have of heaven, come on, they're not of us sitting around on clouds playing harps. It'd be better for the electric guitars, but even so, we're going to be walking together hand in hand. There are rivers, there are, are trees, there is grass, there's beautiful places, there's buildings, there's mansions, there's life. And everything I loved as a child in this park called Disneyland that was so surreal to me was just a taste of what heaven is going to be like. That's something to get excited about. And so I hope you've had an experience in your life where you've been set free from something and that you're grateful. You're grateful that God has, 
has, has helped free you from that burden, has fixed that relationship, has saved you from embarrassment when you make a mistake. But I hope you also know that not everything is guaranteed in this life to be easy or to be fixed. But everything in the next is promised that way in Christ Jesus. And we should have tremendous joy. Thank you, God, for saving me as a little boy from the embarrassment when I wet my pants. And thank you, God, for saving me for the sinful choices I've made in life. And thank you, God, for saving me from the hopelessness that this world continually seems to pour out upon us. You give us hope. Thank you, God, for saving me. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I invite you. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song, and I want you to come. I want you to come. I want you to share that you just want Jesus. And I'll tell you how to have a relationship with him. So this is your invitation. I invite you to come. Let's stand and pray. Father God, we come to you today as those who have tremendous histories. And you know each and every detail of our life. You know the things that we've been saved from. You know the things we haven't been. But you also know that you hold in front of us this promise of Jesus Christ, death upon the cross, saving us from sin, saving us from hopelessness. God, we ask that not only would we grab a hold of that gift if we don't already have it, but that we would spend some time being thankful, deeply appreciative, for what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. Father, for those that need to make a decision, give them courage to step forward even now as we sing. In Jesus' name.